Okay, good day. All participants, all colleagues, all brothers, all our family neuroendoscopic. I'm really ha uh, happy to see uh, and uh, a topic of uh, our seminars, our webinars uh, was uh, is the intraventricular uh, endoscopic surgery. Why uh, is a very interesting topic? Because the ventricular system the prepares the ideal site for the endoscopy. So why a lot of possibilities now rapidly grows for this kind of surgery. Uh, also, not only place, not only anatomy, also the today's science, today's technology rapidly improved and we have more, uh, more, more beautiful, more amazing endoscope in our hands. Uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant images, brilliant lights, uh, possible to uh, decrease in the size of the endoscope, for example. Now we have possibility to use the 3D endoscope, uh, for example, a lot of tools inside also, like a Nico, ultrasound, laser, and so on. So I hope uh, all these possibilities uh, our faculty uh, introduced for us and for, uh, for participants of these uh, webinars. And uh, uh, we uh, use the uh, brilliant knowledge of our faculties and introduce in our departments for our, for, for our patients. So uh, uh, this is the main idea of this webinar. So the first, uh, first lecture is from uh, our, uh, our uh, expert uh, from Germany, uh, uh, Joachim Oertel. Oertel uh, Professor Oertel, uh, this is uh, one of the leader of the of the um, neuroendoscopy, Walter endoscopy, very world renowned. And uh, when I was very young, like a resident, I come and visit the Greisberg Clinic and see the, uh, the, his surgery. <laughs> if he, if you remember <laughs> this time, so Joachim, please, please your lecture. Thank you, thank you so much. So I will share my screen. Do you see the my my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much, Albert, for the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, uh, webinar series. I think this is a very dedicated uh, series with a, a lot of sessions on neuroendoscopy, and I think the interventricular part is actually the part where, well, at least we neurosurgeons we started from. So I think it's a very important part of the endoscopy, although it's by far in our hands at least not the most frequent part anymore. We use the endoscope in much more cases than skull base and uh, spine endoscopy than in the interventricular cases, just because the caseload is higher. But I think the origin of neuroendoscopy is, is interventricular cases. So I will talk about solid uh, tumors and endoscopic applications. And uh, well, when we think about endoscopy, we always think about small crinotomy, then a smaller approach, and then sometimes additional information at the target. When we discuss the different indications, we think about transcranial approaches, endonasal approaches, and transcranial approaches. We will a little bit uh, um, here on this is a little bit endo assist, what my, the next speaker is going to present. Here, the, the focus on this session today is transventricular surgery. So the sheer endoscopic surgery. That means we work through an endoscopic sheet and we don't have uh, uh, enough space in the tube to maneuver with uh, regular instruments. When we think about sheer endoscopy, we think about burr hole. So very small cranotomy, minimum. Just the worksheet introduction. So very, very uh, reduced surgical trauma. And then additional information at the target. I think this is not that important, but we can offer additional treatment options. So when we think about interventricular endoscopy in tumors, well, basically any lesion close to the ventricles or within the ventricles is a potential candidate for endoscopy. Then we think on one hand, 
of the tumor procedure, so biopsy resection, or a restoration of CSF circulation, so mainly ETD, septostomy, and so on. We have to have in mind that we don't have the bimanual surgical skills. And I think only a small part of the interventricular tumors is really a good candidate for a shear endoscopic approach because we don't have the bimanual surgical technique. Well, bleeding is a problem. We have to use then uh, particular techniques like dry field techniques and so on. If we want to proceed even with minimal bleeding and tumor procedures and shear endoscopy, and it might be time consuming. So a tight selection of the surgical candidates is required. We use the standard endoscopic equipment. I think except for the endoscopic biopsy, the flexible endoscope is in at least in solid tumor resection, not a good option. I think all these cases have to be done with a rigid endoscope, just because if you have minimal bleeding, you have much better uh, options to restore uh, a good vision and to control the bleeding. Angled optics, well, I think in most of the tumor procedures, when we think about tumor resection, we don't need angled optics. A zero degree scope or six degree scope, whatever, even a 30 degree scope, when you have the straight view uh, in your surgical field, then this is important. The very, very wide angled optics are not that important. But we need the standard instruments like grasping forceps, bipolar, monopolar, even a laser probe might be very um, uh, useful. And important is that we have a good re irrigation device and uh, a um, bipolar diatom. The first indication in our series when we started this in the, the first uh, years, we basically used the endoscope in cases of interventricular tumors primarily to, to restore the CSF circulation. So then we did ETV and septostomy. Those are, I think, the two most frequent techniques to restore CSF circulation. And then if we had restored the CSF circulation and this tumor, uh, basically histology was unknown or you, know, you could resect the tumor, then the next step was that we did a tumor procedure and did a biopsy or a tumor resection. This well strategy has changed over the years since now we also do uh, some tumor um, resections without CSF uh, circulation problems. So the patients do not need to have hydrocephalus to be a good candidate for an endoscopic approach. So when we think about interventricular or adjacent to the ventricular system lesions, then we think about tumor biopsy. And we, at least in our hands, this is the most frequent indication. We do the most, most part of the tumor procedures we do for biopsy. Do we, get the idea about histology. Then the next important part is uh, cystic lesions. We do fenestration, cyst resection, like in colloid cysts, for example. And just a smaller part of the tumors is a good candidate for an endoscopic, shear endoscopic resection. So it's quite difficult to select a good solid tumor candidate for a shear endoscopic procedure. So, well, they might be too large. You don't know how firm the tumors are. Is it possible to suck it away? Is it possible to shrink it with a, the bipolar diatomy? Or for example, is it possible to um, evacuate it with a, a ultrasonic aspirator? So this is difficult. The sex and second most difficult thing is that they're frequently too vascularized to um, have, be a good candidate. So if you touch the tumor, and it starts bleeding a lot that you have to use to suck out all the CSF, you have to use this uh, dry field technique, then it might be difficult to be a good candidate. And then if it's too large, it might be too time consuming. So we have mainly, um, well, two or three standard approaches for the lateral ventricle. We calculate an anterior or a posterior bear hole. So here, from anterior or from posterior. The temporal horn, actually, we don't access that, that frequently within shear endoscopic technique. For the third ventricle, 
you have basically an anterior approach through the foramen of Monroe. Then we have a microsurgical approach, trans lamina terminalis, or a posterior approach um, from uh, infratentorial supracerebellar. And the fourth ventricle, in our hands, at least it's, if it's not a huge enlarged fourth ventricle, we do a trans aqueductal approach almost always with a flexible endoscope. So when we select the approach, we need to have full access to the lesion. So we have to be the we have to have the option that we can resect the lesion completely. We need sufficient space for manipulation. I think this is very important. Sometimes it might not be easy to come from a posterior approach if the lesion is in the posterior lateral ventricle because you don't have enough space to maneuver your instruments. You just uh, touch with the tip of the sheet uh, all the time the tumor. So you need sufficient space for manipulation. And I think a, a very important part is that you have to have the a, a possibility to switch with the same approach to microsurgery if you have a problem. I think this is a, a major important part to, to uh, have a safe surgery. I give you some examples. This is a tumor here in the left lateral ventricle, solid tumor. And I think this is a small tumor, about eight millimeters in diameter. And I think this is an ideal candidate for an endoscopic approach. Just to get you the idea here, this was actually done in the dry field technique. <clears throat> It's not sheer dry field, it's little dry field. You see that it's just here, it's the level of the CSF. And this is a very small lesion. The diameter of the, of the uh, bipolar diatomy is two millimeters, so it might be eight, eight by eight millimeters. And this is an ideal candidate for a surgical endoscopic resection. Even if you have bleeding with a, such a candidate, you can um, uh, obtain hemostasis easily. This is an example for the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle, small solid tumor here in the aqueduct. This is a good candidate for an endoscopic biopsy, but not a complete excision because this is a typical case where we do the ETV. And then after ETV, I will just forward this. You see here the aqueduct, and this is a typical uh, lesion in the aqueduct. You can do a sufficient biopsy. and obtain hemostasis. In our hands, we always do the CSF circulation restoration first, and then the second step is the tumor procedure because frequently you have some bleeding with the tumor procedure. Might not be a big bleeding, might be a small bleeding, but you have blurred vision. So I think for the CSF circulation restoration, you should use the uh, optimum um, vision. You see here the post-operative, this was the ETV, and this is the lesion here, which was done, the biopsy turned out to be a, a grade two diffuse astrocytoma. Then for colloid cyst, I will not go into detail because colloid cyst was already a topic, I think, in this uh, series of webinars. So I just, I just, I just think I skip this, but this is a good candidate, even if they are firm, for endoscopic resection, you can restore the CSF circulation just by resection of the colloid cells. I will come to a couple of uh, cases, I think, which are good candidates, solid tumors, good candidates for resection. So this is a 74 year old with obstructive hydrocephalus. You see this lesion here is a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma here. And this is the intraoperative video. This is the last time we had the bipolar from Irby. Now they are all gone. This was a, a Irby company a distributed manufactured product. You can coagulate and cut within one step. I think this was very helpful, but uh, since it was so fragile, it's not on the market anymore. But you see here, even if it's a very, very purely vascularized tumor, it takes a while to um, grasp and resect. And this was a small lesion. This, this lesion here, you see it might be, well, maybe 15 millimeters in diameter from anterior to posterior, and maybe one centimeter, 10 millimeters from, me, from medium to lateral. This is the post-op. So that, I think this is an ideal candidate for an endoscopic resection. 
Another example, obstructive hydrocephalus, significant obstructive hydrocephalus, very old patient, 84 years old, and this lesion in the fourth ventricle. So you see here, chronic hydrocephalus. Very, very um, large diameter of the mammillary bodies here. They are pushed lateral. This is the clivus. So ETD was done. And then the next step is the, wait, is the transframinal uh, with the flexible endoscope tumor biopsy Transaqueductal tumor biopsy in the fourth ventricle. This 84 year old actually turned out to have a pilocytic astrocytoma. Very interesting. Patient only received ETV and we just did follow up. And at some point, I think at 88 or so, we lost the, the lady for follow up. I, I guess that she at some point died on, on another problem, not on this uh, pilocytic astrocytoma. Another case, more recent case, you see a 36 year old patient with visual field deficit. And this is the lesion here. Looks almost like a colloid cyst in the foramen of Monroe. No big hydrocephalus, just little enlarged ventricles, but not significant hydrocephalus. And this is the lesion here. Rather small foramen of Monroe. So all this indicates a rather acute obstructive hydrocephalus, obstruct, uh, acute symptomatology. And then we did, during the procedure, we thought that might be colloid cysts, but actually uh, the, the lesion was very adherent at all adjacent structures. I will forward a little bit more. This is the lesion here, taken out. Then we send for histopathology and it turned out to be uh, metastasis. So this is the post-op images. Another, I think, ideal candidate for an endoscopic approach. Another example, 21 year old female patient and uh, radiology showed a large tumor in the lateral ventricle, suspicious of neurocytoma here. And this example I just brought because I think this is not a good candidate for an endoscopic approach. Neurocytomas frequently are quite well vascularized. And uh, we decided not to approach this with a shear endoscopic technique. So this is a, in our hands, in our experience, a good candidate for an endoscopic assisted transcolosal approach. And this is the video. Just forward a little bit. You see that you don't you don't get that good uh, anatomy. You don't you work with a bimanual technique and you can resect the lesion from the origin of the uh, ventricle wall ependema. So I think this is impossible to resect such a lesion with a uh, shear endoscopic approach. Yeah, this is then we use the endoscope quite quite frequently in these cases. This is the final inspection with the endoscope of the uh, tumor bed. And then the, the, we've uh, just confirmed that we have resected everything. This is the result two years after surgery here on the right. So on a series, uh, this is 153 cases in 18 years. Actually, I have not updated this. This is the series until two years ago. And you see here, when you look for the distribution of location, third ventricle is two thirds of the lesions, fourth ventricle about 8%, and lateral ventricle is about one fourth. Uh, I want to point out total removal, and total removal was possible in 46 cases, partial removal in 29, and biopsy was by far the most frequent indication in 69 cases. These are the complications. The most important complication, I think, is a bleeding problem. You can um, control the uh, blurred vision a little bit with a drive field technique, and actually bleeding usually stops. But if you have a significant bleeding in the vascularized tumor, even the drive field will not help you because you just don't have the suction, irrigation, coagulation possibilities you have with a, a bimanual technique. 
The second problem is the time consuming. If it's big uh, lesion, then I think this is a frequent problem that you overestimated the, the time you need um, uh, or underestimated the time you need for a tumor resection. So general results in the tumor procedure and biopsy, we have a diagnostic yield actually of 100%. Bleeding is a frequent problem. There's no emergency stopping, but a switch to microscope and four. Solid tumors larger than two centimeters are not suitable. Well, they are under some conditions suitable. And um, it's, I regret a little bit that Pepe is not going to give his talk, his very nice talk on uh, ultrasonic aspirator today, because I think it did would be fit very well in this uh, webinar session, actually. Uh, but there's an ultrasonic aspirator, and uh, I will just give you an example here. You can even resect larger tumors. This is a tumor in the third, subependymoma in the third, and in the diaphragm technique and the ultrasonic aspirator, you might be able to resect even larger solid tumors. But as a thumb roll, I think two centimeters is, is a good roll, maybe 2.5 centimeters, not larger than that you should uh, try to approach if you have not a lot of experience. So tumors are good in the ventricle system or adjacent to ventricle system are good candidates for a neural endoscopic approach. We have to select whether we approach them by the shear endoscopy with a um, a tube-based system or with an endoscopic assisted, micro, assisted microsurgical approach. And the large avascular tumors or um, solid tumors, um, uh, smaller diameter are good candidates for shear endoscopic approach. And I want to acknowledge all these people who I work with and who uh, contributed a part of the cases. And well, thank you for listening. Maybe there are some questions. Joachim, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I see a lot of experience, a lot. And many thanks for your very experienced hand. A very difficult case you show us, very interesting. And uh, I want to ask you, how, how frequently you use dry field when you have, for example, bleeding? Um, well, if, well, well the, the thing is that the cases are rare. So we only have like 10 to 15 solid tumors per year. If we c consider those 10 to 15, then we use the dry field technique at least in a third of them. So if we have the problem with bleeding, then we use it very frequently. But since we don't have so many solid tumors, we approach with the endoscope, it's not that frequent. So in your opinion, five is it, cases per year. I, I don't I don't have numbers on this. So your opinion is it's possible. It's possible yeah. to close if you, if you have problem with bleeding, for example. So actually, in most of the cases, it stops by its own. The bleeding stops when you just suck uh, suck out the CSF. It's it's I think it's a very elegant technique to get hemostasis. The thing is, if you are not done with the tumor resection, you have to continue and then it starts to bleed again. This, it, it, even then the dry field technique does not help much. The, and, and, and another, another, I want to ask you, what about the monoportal opinion about monoportal idea? Monoportal, not one port. I see you actually about the one port. Yeah. One port, yeah so, so, so why? So by portal, by portal is, is uh, another good idea. I think the thing is, it's, it's like, it's a little bit like spine endoscopy. When you think that you can do everything with a small skin incision, of course you can mini, be minimally invasive if you use, use your standard microsurgical approach. But you have to be honest, frequently if, if people don't pay that much attention, then they have a huge approach. And this happens in the brain and the spine. So the standard microsurgical approach in experience hands might be very minimally invasive. But for in, in other hands, it might be very, very invasive. So particularly for those who have not that much experience, I think a limitation of the uh, approach trauma, like in a tube-based system, might be a good option. And then two tubes, it's much less invasive than a huge, um, um, massive compression of the brain tissue with, with a, a large uh, microsurgical approach. It's, it's a matter of experience. I think, of course, if you if you can approach the same lesion with only one approach with one port, one port is better. Mm -hmm. If it's safer and you can resect the lesion with a biport, 
uh, instead of a microsurgical approach, well, you can discuss. But you know, the, the smaller the approach, the better for the patient. But first, first thing has to be that we we know the structures and it's a safe surgery. Okay, maybe maybe Giuseppe, you have a question? Professor Cinale, please. No, no, no questions. Uh, the same questions about dry field technique. I, I've been using it for the last couple of years. And uh, uh, one thing that I would like to ask you, I know that you are not using very frequently the uh, uh, ultrasonic aspirator. Uh, I only use the dry field uh, when I use the ultrasonic aspirator. And in this case, I am a little bit afraid of the sucking uh, power of the ultrasonic aspirator, creating an empty ventricle too quickly or too rapidly. Do you have some uh, special advice on how to create the empty uh, field, uh, the dry field in your ventricle without taking the risk to uh, having a brain collapse or uh, too dramatic? Actually, actually decrease we don't the have a big problem with brain collapsing brain. I don't, I don't have well, we basically don't see that. What we use is like a neonatal gas nasogastric tube. It just fits the GAP endoscope and then we suck the, the CSF away and then we have the dry fold technique. This is what we use. And well, I agree with you, the ultrasonic aspirator has a problem because it sucks. And usually when you have the bimanual technique, you just have the, the suction and the ultrasonic aspirator. So you can push the tissue back with the left hand while you, uh, you know, if you're right-handed, while you, while you use the ultrasonic aspirator on the right. And this is the problem with all these shear endoscopic techniques. We just have one, we, we are, we are we're very limited. We, it's is a, not a bimanual technique, it's a monomanual technique. So if you have a problem with this mono uh, hand, with this one instrument, you're in trouble. And I agree with you that this, this is a disadvantage of the ultrasonic aspirator in the shear endoscopic technique. If you have a second instrument in the surgical field, it's not a problem. Yeah, I so, think that uh, the, 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 the solution that you have created with, uh, with GAB uh, of the dry field is uh, extraordinary and uh, is the, probably is the next frontier of intraventricular tumor surgery. Probably uh, indications can be enlarged with the dry field technique if we create a way to have, uh, I've still, um, I still, I trust you, but I still feel uh, uncomfortable in uh, children when you have those very large ventricular dilatation and uh, to remove all of the uh, lateral ventricle CSF to uh, arrive to the foramen of Monroe, I, I still am uh, quite afraid of this. So uh, I think uh, we, I'm thinking about some uh, system of uh, creating a, uh, some stable pressure, you know, <laughs> like uh, they do in the yeah. abdominal cavity, but it's very complicated. But, in, but actually, uh, as you in, in, in my, in my um, memory, I think with the problems we had were in the very old patients. So it's like a, a subdural hematoma because, you know, what happens when they have a ventricular collapse? You have stress on the cortical veins. Okay, yeah, sure. so, and, and in the infants, actually, usually they, they, it's not that frequent that they develop, develop a spontaneous subdural. But in the in the very old patients, you know, this is they have a, a lot of um, um, brain atrophy, and and this we had. I think I have to look it up, but I think we had two or three cases where we had not really trouble, but we thought, well, shall we do something? And then resolved after after time. After you know, okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so <laughs> much. What, sorry, one more question. Very oh. interesting topic. Very interesting topic for me, especially. Uh, uh, what is uh, about uh, still critical uh, size of the tumor, on your opinion? Why why two centimeters? Why not more, why not less? Why 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 two centimeters? Still well, critical this or actually critical today. Um, well, I think less is no problem. It can be very small. Uh, this is not an issue. Why, Bigger, why two? If it's four or so, um, well. The, then it's it's if if you have a good candidate for the ultrasonic aspirator, it's a vascularized tumor. Then it can be larger. But if you have a vascularized tumor or you have to do a piecemeal resection, it just takes so much time, you know. And and then 
it's also a difference if you have an in the third or the lateral. In the lateral, basically, you can approach everything with a microsurgical approach without much risk very easily. So if you have a big lesion in the lateral ventricle and it takes, let's say, four hours to take it out and with a microsurgical approach, one hour, I don't know. I mean, we also have to consider the time of surgery being one influential factors for complication. Now, I, I, I'm still sure that it's less invasive, but you know, it's just, you know, the, the general anesthesia and the surgical time is also a matter of invasiveness. Joachim, uh, you have experience using laser. You have we, just, laser. We, just have, we just have the first experience now with a laser for a couple of weeks, and it's a lovely instrument. I use it basically every day. <laughs> But in, in, in tumor surgery, it's, it's amazing too, amazing. Tool. It's very good. The vaporization is very but, good. Uh, but I, maybe, maybe now no limit in the future. No limit, no. There's <laughs> nothing without <laughs> limits. <laughs> this is Germany here. <laughs> but, okay. but I think you, you might be right. We can hurry up. We can um, uh, uh, accelerate the, the tumor uh, resection and then we, we might be able to, do, uh, to resect larger tumors. Okay. Yeah. Every day we receive a lot of new tools. So uh, this is uh, give us possibility for the, this kind of surgery. I hope and I believe. So like, like, like that. Okay. So maybe we limited time a little bit. So next Thank speaker. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I very lovely, lovely see you. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Siberia. <laughs> So next, uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Kazuhita Takeuchi, a very famous uh, guy, neuroscopist guy from Japan, also our friends. Uh, I see his uh, work and his le uh, lecture in my place. So Kazuhita, please, please. Please, Takeuchi. Okay. 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 Can you see this? Yeah, it's okay. Beautiful. Okay. Oh. Also, very uh, interesting topic. Very interesting topic. New technique, also. Okay. Uh, thank you for giving me the great opportunity. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I'm from Nagoya University here, uh, central part of Japan. Uh, we have a very beautiful castle. So, if you have a chance to come here, uh, please visit uh, this castle. Anyway, uh, today's my topic is endoscopic surgery for ventricular regions. Uh, the resolution of the endoscope uh, improving like this. Uh, HD and 4K endoscope now available. And uh, uh, this uh, endoscope uh, provides the same quality images as microscope. We mainly use the uh, endoscope for ventricular regions. We use a flexible endoscope and a rigid endoscope. A flexible endoscope is used for the biopsy, ETV, and the cyst penetration. And a rigid endoscope is mainly used for the tumor removal. Today's my topic is here. Uh, ventricular surgery with flexible endoscope and uh, ventricular surgery with rigid endoscope. There may be a slight overlap in topics with uh, Professor Otto, but uh, uh, I want to introduce Japanese style endoscopic ventricular surgery technique. Uh, this 60 year old male appeared with a consciousness disturbance and uh, uh, MRI labeled a uh, uh, pineal tumor here and obstructive hydrocephalus. So uh, uh, I performed the ETV and biopsy in this case. We made a single bar hole here and insert the cylinder to the lateral ventricle. And then uh, insert uh, this fresh brain scope to the uh, south ventricle. Uh, this can be bent. And uh, firstly, I performed the uh, biopsy from here and then open the ETV. 
This is a surgical video. Uh, this is a lateral ventricle. So this is a video scope, so or we can get the uh, uh, beautiful uh, images with this end scope. Uh, this is aqueduct. Aqueduct was compressed by the tumor like that. And as you can see, this is a habanero commissure. And uh, I uh, harvest the uh, specimens from the top of the tumor here. Fortunately, this tumor is not so hemorrhagic, so oh, we can stop breathing with uh, uh, just rinsing like this. After that, we perform the ETD. <coughs> like this. We use uh, uh, this specific uh, balloon catheter for the ETD. Of course, this uh, uh, stoma is not so large, uh, but uh, this tumor is a pure uh, germinoma, so or we can uh, 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 Resolve the obstructive hydrocephalus with uh, chemical therapy. So I think it's enough. After the surgery, the uh, uh, CSF flow is enough, like that. Now he's doing well. The next case is the tumor removal with a flexible endoscope. This uh, flexible endoscope can be used for the tumor removal, only for the, uh, of course, only for the small tumors. This 38 year old male appear with a headache and uh, MRI with a uh, hydrocephalus and the tumor is located in the posterior side ventricle here. Uh, the tumor uh, is stuck to the uh, aqueduct here. But uh, as you can see, the uh, tumor stalk is very small. So uh, we performed the uh, tumor removal surgery with flex brain scope. We made a bar hole here and insert the cylinder to the uh, lateral ventricle, like that. This is a surgical video. As you can see, this is a tumor. Of course, we harvest uh, some specimen and uh, this tumor is uh, 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 ependymoma. There's no adhesion around the aqueduct. Uh, we can bend the uh, uh, flexible endoscope. So uh, this movement is very useful for the dissection, like this. And a uh, good dissection was performed. After that, uh, uh, we grab the uh, digital stalk here and twist it. And gross total removal is achieved like that. Uh, two centimeter tumor can be removed uh, with uh, uh, this flex brain scope. Uh, this tumor is a good candidate for the uh, flex brain scope removal. The next topic is ventricular surgery with rigid endoscope. Uh, post surgery, we call this technique as uh, a cylinder surgery. There are various seats now available. We mainly use uh, this type of cylinder, uh, Neuroport and Neuroport Mini, uh, 10 millimeter and the six millimeter diameter seats. This is how I introduce, introduce the cylinder. Endoscope tip is carried by a uh, uh, navigation system like this. And the uh, end scope is inserted inside this type of translucent test up needle. Like this. 
for doing so, we can notice the location of the uh, uh, tip of the uh, end scope with the navigation guidance. And also we can uh, get a direct viewing of the uh, needle tip here. This technique is very useful for the uh, cylinder surgery. Uh, this is how I uh, uh, perform the uh, removal surgery inside the cylinder. The cylinder is held by assistant very gently and uh, 2.7 or four millimeter endoscope inside it inside the cylinder and one or two instrument uh, inserted in uh, co coaxially. And uh, in the ventricular surgery, uh, I use a wet field technique. So uh, drip line is also inserted inside the cylinder to fill the ventricular side, uh, ventricular uh, with ventricle with water, like this. So this technique is uh, uh, endoscopic assisted microsurgery. Uh, I introduced some cases. This 50 year old male appeared with a headache, uh, but uh, at, at, at first the uh, tumor was not so large. Uh, so we choose uh, a conservative therapy, but uh, uh, after several years, the uh, uh, tumor get enlarged like this, so or we perform the uh, lingual surgery for this patient. This is a surgical uh, strategy. Uh, bar holes should be made anterior uh, like this and uh, medial like this because the uh, shape of lateral ventricle is bold. Uh, patient have relatively narrow ventricles uh, so uh, surgical fields should be filled up with water to keep the uh, ventricular size intact. This is a surgical video. We made a two centimeter uh, small craniotomy and this is a lateral ventricle. This is tumor. Uh, this tumor is not so uh, breathable, so, and uh, uh, suckable tumor, so it's not so difficult to remove, fortunately. This rotating movement is very useful for the uh, dissection in the narrow surgical corridor. Dissect the tumor. After that, uh, we in inserted the flexible endoscope to confirm this part. There is a residual tumor around this, uh, this area, so or, or we remove this one. And very good, removal was achieved. The next case is a pineal tumor. Uh, Five-year-old male, Appear with a uh, uh, headache and vomiting. Uh, the uh, MRI revealed the uh, hydrocephalus, and uh, uh, the tumor was located in the uh, pineal area. But uh, uh, but this tumor is mainly located in the uh, posterior uh, part of the third ventricle here. So uh, this is a surgical strategy. We made a uh, uh, bar hole in this area. But uh, uh, for the cylinder insertion, uh, we have to sacrifice the anterior, uh, anterior septal vein for expanding from a model here and uh, sacrifice the uh, mass intermediate, this one, uh, for approaching blood. We perform this surgery with a six millimeter diameter cyst, uh, this one. We insert the cylinder to the lateral ventricle with a navigation guidance, and then uh, cut the uh, mass intermediate in the middle here. After that, we dissect the uh, anterior septal vein 
here. Cooperate and cut. Then we can get into the south ventricle. Now we are dissecting the tumor from the uh, tectum. All procedure was performed under water. Like this. Uh, there are some uh, arteries and veins around the tumor. So we coagulate and cut like this. Now this is the opposite side. Uh, opposite side was also dissected with the same fashion. But this tumor was strongly adhered to the uh, ICV here. So we uh, divided it into the two parts. And the main part was removed. Like this. Two centimeter tumor was removed. And after that, the uh, uh, residual part was also removed. Then the uh, gross total removal is achieved. And uh, damage to the uh, foramen mondo is, I think, minimal. This, this is a post-op MRI. Uh, good removal is achieved. Like this. And uh, 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 damage to the uh, brain parenchyma is also uh, minimal. Uh, I skip this uh, this case because of the lack of lack of time. We can also perform uh, the uh, CBD surgery with the uh, endoscope, clipping in the uh, for the uh, interventricular aneurysm case. This is our surgical tools. Uh, this rotating dissector, uh, this one is uh, uh, served by a stalls. This rotating dissector is very useful in the cylinder surgery. And uh, this malleable forceps is also useful for the uh, uh, cylinder surgery. And I uh, usually use a, a scope, uh, endoscope holder, like this one or this one. Uh, endoscope is powerful too for the interventricular regions. Surgical planning is essential for this surgery. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Brilliant lecture, brilliant lecture. Very good idea. Thank you. <laughs> very good idea. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, some, some questions, if possible. Yeah. Why, why you do at first uh, biopsy and then ETV? Uh, because uh, Sorry, if you, you perform the uh, ETV first, the ventricular size become smaller than the uh, before surgery, before ETV. So I want to uh, have a larger space and uh, uh, I'm a little bit worried about the dissemination. So uh, I prefer to perform the uh, uh, biopsy first, then ETV. But mostly biopsy and then the hemorrhage and not good visible, so like this. Yeah. No. And a uh, little bit biopsy, If you make good biopsy, big piece, yeah. for example. Because yeah. another, a second question is about the sensitivity of your biopsy. Your opinion, endoscopic sensitivity is very important. CVD, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sensitivity, sensitivity, biopsy for biopsy. Yeah. So but sometimes we take biopsy no result. Endoscopic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Volume of the biopsy is uh, it's not, not enough. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I experience, uh, in my in my experience, uh, I performed uh, maybe 100 or more biopsy with uh, this technique. But uh, uh, every time I, I can get the uh, pathological diagnos diagnosis. So I think it's not uh, the size of biopsy is not uh, not so small. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I make a okay. comment? Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, I I think biopsy is is. Um, it's 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 different because we don't when we do the biopsy we, we don't think much about endoscopic technique, but we have recently analyzed our uh, by endoscopic biopsy we use basically navigation, and a sedan probe like like a standard stereotactic biopsy but, the lesions were all in the ventricle so you have the advantage that you really see that you don't have a bleeding which is different from stereotaxy. And the other advantage is that you look at the lesion. So you know that you're within the lesion, at least in our, well, we don't have that many cases, like 20 cases or so. It was published, I think, in World Neurosurgery, but I'm not, this year, I think. And in, in our cases, it was 100% diagnostic yield. We always get a diagnostic um, specimen because you see the lesion and we had no bleeding. So it's, it's another completely different aspect. It doesn't have to do anything with the resection in my, in my opinion. It's a completely different indication. So we usually don't do biopsy then surgery. We use either surgery or biopsy, but I mean, everybody has a different, you know, it's also approach and a different habit. You have to guide the patient and you can argue in favor or against biopsy and then um, success succeeded by by resection. It depends on, on I mean the different culture you discuss with the patient and your 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 approach. So I will not judge it. I don't say that it's right or wrong. But endoscopy might play a role in biopsy as well. It's it's. I, I was surprised when we did this study that we could control really. We see that the biopsy does not cause any bleeding. I think this is an important aspect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor De Pujari, what is your opinion about this situation? About endoscopic biopsy? Uh, I think we uh, do this fairly commonly for the third ventricular lesions. Uh, and uh, uh, we have also tried to do some excisions uh, after uh, uh, we have. Uh, acquired the uh, endoscopic uh, cavitron. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the <clears throat> uh, tubular retractor, we, we use a simple uh, uh, syringe kind of a tube uh, to do this, uh, but mainly if we are thinking of excising the lesion, okay. not only for biopsies. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor, uh, Professor Takeuchi, and uh, if I understand you, you, you uh, standardly use for biopsy flexible endoscope. Yeah, for the ventricular region, uh, uh, I, yes. But for the uh, interparenchymal region, I use uh, cylinder surgery, uh, rigid endoscope. Professor, Professor Erter, you use rigid or flexible? <laughs> So this is a very different approach. We never use flexible. Well, we I, I showed a case where we no, use flexible. Most, yeah. most of the cases we use rigid. Most of the cases we use rigid because we want to have a very good stereotactic frameless navigation that we really are in the in the body of the lesion. This I think is very difficult with the flexible. So yeah, two different techniques, Asian very and different European. approach. Yeah. And European. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Professor Chinali, what is your opinion about this? You you use two bar hole or one bar hole, flexible or rigid? What is about your biopsy? Well, in, in, in Italy, in Italy, uh, we are not allowed to use a flexible or steerable endoscope or videoscope inside the brain, so we are very limited. We are always surprised by extraordinary technology of Japanese. I strongly agree with Joachim about uh, uh, the endoscopic stereotactic biopsy. Uh, since his paper, 
we have uh, uh, done this uh, and uh, I agree that is an extraordinary plus uh, in a big advantage in seeing the lesion, see where you are taking the biopsy, um, higher safety, higher reliability. So it's, uh, and I want to congratulate uh, Professor Takeuchi because uh, his removal of uh, teratoma of pineal endoscopically uh, through an enlarged the transcoroidal approach is absolutely fantastic. I've never seen anything like that. And uh, really, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very congratulations, Professor Takeuchi. Very congratulations for your technique. Thank you. And uh, now we limit in time also. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Giuseppe Zinale. Uh, our leader in our neuroendoscopic world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's uh, uh, thank you to the um, no, no other words all, about you <laughs> to all the all the organizers. Thank you, Albert, for uh, inviting me in this uh, very nice webinar. And let me talk about turbinectomy and shunt malfunction. Is uh, uh, one of uh, my very first love in uh, endoscopic surgery, as you know. And I'm also very grateful to. Uh, Piero Spennato, who is working at this subject and keeping track of this patient in the last in the last years. As an introduction, we know that the risk of shunt malfunction is high, 15, 20% in the first year uh, after shunt and 5% each year thereafter, with more than 80% of patients requiring revision 12 years of follow-up in the pediatric population. Uh, ETV certainly offer options at shunt failure, and the only slight difference are noted in success rate between primary ETV and secondary, at least in our earliest experience when there was a very, very large uh, population of shunted uh, obstructive hydrocephalus many years ago, and uh, endoscopy was uh, uh, just starting. So uh, certainly the percentage and the uh, features of the populations are different nowadays, with more and more endoscopy being done as a primary option, but still we can see good candidate for this kind of uh, um, uh, procedure. The candidate are the shunted patient. Why a shunted patient uh, is not being treated by ETV, essentially because uh, they were considered as not candidates to ETV in the neonatal age, or because uh, potentially candidates uh, to ETV, but they have been treated primarily in a department where endoscopy was not uh, feasible. Uh, so uh, what is our criteria for patient selection for ETV at the time of shunt malfunction is the presence of an obstructive hydrocephalus at the time of shunt malfunction, regardless of the original cause and radiological appearance of the hydrocephalus. Whatever is uh, post-hemorrhagic, post-infective, or post-myelomeningous yield, if there are features of obstructive hydrocephalus, then we propose the uh, um, uh, ETV instead of a shunt revision. Uh, we know that the hydrocephalus have changed patterns. After implanting of a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, there is an inversion of the CSF flow because of the CSF flowing upwards through the aqueduct through the shunt with an inversion of the pressure gradient, the possible deformation of the vermis and of the aqueductal region, and then the creation of a secondary aqueductal stenosis. This is not our idea. This has been proved since the earliest time of ventriculography. So the simple implant of a shunt can induce the creation of a secondary aqueductal stenosis. And when we start to create a, 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 the depression inside the ventricle by implanting a shunt and we um, reduce the ventricular size, then of course we enlarge the subarachnoid spaces and probably in children, maturation of the arachnoid villi increases the probability of an effective ETV when the children are grown up and the way they present to us after five or six or seven years after birth. We know very well this, uh, this was uh, one of our, my very, very first patients in Paris with a uh, communicating pattern of hydrocephalus at the time of shunt uh, implant, but then coming back after a couple of years with the shunt malfunction, you can see that the, the pattern is completely different. The full ventricle is very, very small. And so this patient who was not a good candidate at the time of uh, um, earliest days of life as a newborn becomes a good candidate for ETV when he grows up at the time of a shunt malfunction. And this is the same patient with a typical pattern of obstructive hydrocephalus, complete obstruction of the aqueduct, midline midbrain edema, and the downward bulging uh, of the floor uh, of the third ventricle, clearly a very good 
uh, candidate for uh, ETV, and this is after ETV with a good restoration of uh, CSF through the um, through the endoscopic eventually lost. So certainly, uh, we know that there is an increased efficacy in case of secondary ETV. For example, in post-hemorrhagic cardiocephalus, we have only 27% of success rate in newborns, whereas it becomes more than 70% after four or five or six years of age. Post-meningitic cardiocephalus, 0% of success rate in my experience, versus 75% of success rate in uh, children after shunt malfunction, and also with myelomeningocele, 25% uh, without CPC in our uh, experience in newborns becomes 60% of success rate at the time of shunt uh, malfunction. So preoperative MRI is mandatory to select your patient, of course. In case of aqueductal stenosis, you have to think about ETV, but also in case of stenosis of foramina of Lushka on Magendi. It's not a triventricular hydrocephalus, it's not a mandatory pattern. You can also have uh, a, a good tetraventricular obstructive hydrocephalus. This is a typical fantastic case of obstructive triventricular hydrocephalus. You see that there is a, a, a clear uh, pattern of obstructive hydrocephalus, a portion of the reticulum from a, a supratentorial compartment, a flattening of the midbrain downward bulging floor, flattening of the chiasm of the anterior bulging of the lamina terminalis. These are all radiological images that claim and call for endoscopic ventriculosity, but also this with an obstruction of Lushka foramens, which creation of Lushka diverticula that are witnessing for a pressure gradient between the fourth ventricle and the cistern around the uh, um, basilar artery, this patient also can be a good candidate for uh, endoscopic ventriculosity. So you just have to look for obstructive pattern of uh, um, CSF circulation. And um, at least, of course, to be feasible, you need to uh, have uh, uh, at least a, a, a lateral ventricle that are suitable for an, um, uh, the entrance of, uh, of, an of, um, uh, of an endoscope, one foramen or lower large enough and the third ventricle large enough to admit the endoscope. You are, um, uh, should check for major anatomical abnormalities of the third ventricle that could contraindicate the uh, procedure. And there should be, of course, some space between the dorsal cell and the basal artery, and possibly uh, check for membranes in the prepontine system to be sure that there is no uh, significant too excessive adhesion in the prepontine system. Secondary ETV usually is more difficult than primary ETV, it should not be left to beginners because the ventricular system is smaller, the third ventricle is thicker, and there are, of course, anatomical abnormalities due to long-term long shunting. These are all the small tricks that you should know. The school is thicker with abnormal vascularity if compared to a, a standard patient. The dura can be thicker with subdural membranes that can be the result of subdural hematomas over hygromas in the previous years. The cortex is usually thicker, bloody, and adherent to the dura. The walls of the lateral ventricle are tough and thick because of periventricular gliosis in use by the long-term shunting. So sometimes the ventricular entry is more complicated than in a primary patient. Lateral ventricle, frequently there can be no landmarks without septum pellucidum and anatomical abnormalities. In this case, there is no septum, or you can have elongated foramen moro like in myelo meningocele, and you should be able to also to navigate in very small ventricles with, um, uh, distorted, with distorted anatomy. The third ventricle can be a very narrow cavity encroached by gliotic septa. Mammillary bodies can be unclear and conjoined. The floor can be thick and opaque. And in myelo meningocele, you can have interhypothalamic adhesion that are very significant. Like in this case, check for this interhypothalamic adhesion that is uh, um, creating an obstacle between the infundibular recess and the pre-mammillary area. So this is really very complicated, uh, very complicated. This is not the chiasm, this is an interhypothalamic adhesion 
in my yellow meaning the seal. And check also for the anatomy of the interpedoncular system. There can be arachnoid adhesion and the unusual position also of the basilar arteries. These are also uh, uh, important things that we can uh, should check before uh, before surgery. And is in very frequently the midline midbrain edema. You can see in um, acute dysfunction with the three ventricular patterns of dilatation. You can see this. Uh, two patient uh, with uh, obstruction of the um, aqueduct and they present a midline midbrain edema uh, immediately um, anterior to the aqueduct that regresses completely after endoscopic ventriculostomy. Here you can see also the pattern of downward bulging of the floor of the third ventricle. So check for this. This is um, quite well seen in uh, magnification and can also be found again uh, in uh, access here you can see the three features that are really important. Obstruction of the aqueduct with the webbing inside the aqueduct, midline midbrain edema that is probably uh, witnessing uh, the pressure gradient between the third ventricle and the cistern and the downward bulging of the, of the floor of the third ventricle, very important features with complete restoration after surgery. Here you can see also some other uh, image of the uh, periventricular gliosis, and another case of midline midbrain edema that is uh, quite typical of acute triventricular uh, shunt malfunction. This is how it appears in axial uh, MRIs, and this is, uh, in our experience, quite a good predictor of uh, good success of um, endoscopic ventriculostomy. In my yellow meningocele, my yellow meningocele, certainly the anatomy is much more difficult if compared to a, a, a standard patient because of the uh, malformation. And sometimes you can have images like this. In this case, also you can have a midline midbrain edema. There is a, a clear cut uh, aqueductal stenosis, and you can say interhypothalamic adhesion that can make really troublesome the perforation of the floor of the third ventricle. In this case, um, of course, um, the neuronavigation is mandatory to check for the, uh, um, the place where the, you can perforate. This is the uh, image of the same patient. We are navigating into the lateral ventricle. Here we finally find the foramen of Monroe. Look how distorted is the region of the foramen of Monroe that seems to be very large. Instead, it's very, very narrow. This is the anterior pillar of the fornix, completely deformed. We have to look for the midline after entering into the foramen of Monroe. And here you can see very nicely the interhypothalamic adhesion that is here, that is this image that you can find here on the MRIs. And you should be aware that you have to create your perforation below the interhypothalamic adhesion and not above in order to uh, avoid uh, troubles on this uh, uh, on this patient. Of course, uh, when you know this and when you have the um, navigation, this is very easy, but if you are not experienced enough and without navigation, it can be really very difficult to uh, identify the place where you should create your um, uh, perforation of the floor. In this case, we were uh, lucky enough because with the navigation we were able to find the, uh, the, the place of a perforation. And another case of my yellow meaning scene, you see how elongated and distorted is the uh, um, foramen of Monroe, but it was larger enough in this case, but you see that the anatomy is really complicated, inter, inter hypothalamic adhesions in this case, and also here you cannot recognize at all the, um, uh, the uh, mammillary bodies, and so uh, uh, only the navigation can help us in uh, the perfect uh, perforation of the floor. Really, I could not stress enough the importance of navigation. When the, you have to, um, uh, you have to be sure there are no infection, of course, you have to obtain an MRI preoperatively, consider the size of the ventricular system. If the ventricles are too small, then you can externalize the shunt or clamp the uh, external uh, tubing of the external uh, uh, derivation in order to dilate the ventricle. Sometimes when you have a patient who is infected, like in this case, you can have additional problems. You can have a blurred vision because you are performing endoscopy in um, uh, an infected patient, possibly with a previous ventriculitis. You can have an obstruction of the foramen of Monroe, and especially at the level of the 
region of the infundibular recess, you can have fibrin deposits. Look here, you have to open and look for the foramen of Monroe in this case, and uh, you have to discover where the infundibular recess is. And in this case, it was completely covered by a fibrin deposit at the level of the uh, foramen of the level of the infundibular recess. And so uh, uh, also navigation is very important in this case. And we were able to do the perforation in spite of all this fibrin deposit and uh, navigation is uh, really very, very important whatever the uh, patient that you are treating by um, uh, ETV in a shunt one function. This is another case. For example, you can see here the obstructive ventricular catheter. You see the anatomy that is very, very much uh, different from the standard and another very, very difficult to identify uh, site of perforation. Here you can guess the mammillary bodies, interhypothalamic adhesion, and navigation is really very, very important. But this patient at six years follow-up is completely shunt-free and uh, uh, sometimes it's really worth to do uh, this procedure. Entry point, you should plan the entry point according with the navigation. Navigation is mandatory in our department for ETV during shunt malfunction. Check for the highest possible precision, the track through the foramen of Monroe, and consider also the presence of existing wounds that can distort or can force you to uh, uh, place your entry point in a not ideal position. And uh, these are all things that in a uh, patient operated several times before should be considered uh, before uh, treatment. The more medial trajectory in case of multiples can be important and please use the neural navigation in all cases. And also the continuous irrigation in presence of intraventricular debris can be important in case of previous uh, infection, infundibular recess can be uh, uh, usually a reliable marker, but please use always the neural navigation. Floor perforation, uh, great attention should be done because of the thick and opaque floor. And uh, please inspect the interpeduncular system as soon as possible after the first perforation before enlarging the stoma in order to verify the vascular anatomy and in which places you have uh, performed your first perforation. Of course, after ETV, you have to remove all the residual shunt material because foreign material is prone to infection and uh, intermittent or remaining flow through a malfunctioning shunt may cause reduced flow to the stomach and may promote its closure. But especially if you are operating in an infected, in an infected uh, um, environment, you must remove every single material and endoscopic removal can be helpful either from outside, either from inside the lumen of the uh, ventricular catheter. Postoperatively, uh, uh, EVD, yes or no, ICP monitoring, yes or no, lumbar puncture, yes or no. This is still very much controversial, except for uh, one thing. We have been uh, uh, monitoring ICP for many, many years uh, during uh, after uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, and it was useful in some cases. For example, in this case, seven years old with shunt malfunction in aqueductal stenosis, you see that the ICP can remain high for uh, one day. In this case, it remains high for a uh, second day, but it was uh, going down. Then in the third day, there was a raise in the ICP, becoming symptomatic with a, a, a sudden reason in the fourth days with enlarging ventricle and day four, this uh, EVD was uh, clamped at this time in order to create the best possible flow through the endoscopic ventriculostomy. And in these cases, lumbar puncture can be extremely helpful, one or two lumbar puncture. You see that uh, there is a dramatic drop of ICP immediately after the lumbar puncture. And sometimes normalization of the ICP can be very, very long. And in this case, only after day seven, day eight, the ICP was normal and we were able to remove the um, safety EVD from this patient who remains shunt free. And this is the pattern of a CT scan. You see that before lumbar puncture, the ventricle were dilating again, but after lumbar puncture, the ventricle finally normalized and the patient was uh, shunt free at this time. So always perform at least two lumbar puncture before concluding that uh, your endoscopic third ventriculostomy has failed. Our policy after shunt removal, certainly safety EVD is mandatory. This is the only point that is really, really very, very important. Please place a safety EVD because when you remove a shunt, you take risks for the patient, sometimes of sudden deterioration. So safety EVD is really important. ICP monitoring, we are doing less and less and lumbar puncture, we do it when it is necessary and the patient is uh, symptomatic. 
the results of the uh, ETV after endoscopic subventriculum after uh, shunt removal, you see that whatever the uh, series that we uh, evaluate, the results are relatively good, ranging from 65% to 85%, depending on the uh, different uh, etiologies uh, that you can um, that you can evaluate. The lowest success rate is after meningitis after um, uh, infection you see that the um, success rate is not high is just a little bit higher than 50 percent but still is uh, should be considered when the patient is extremely complicated and in uh, our first paper that we published uh, in 1998 the success result was 76 percent and the most recent paper that we found of from last year from united states the success rate is uh, basically the same so not a significant progress has been done uh, in uh, these uh, 20 years of uh, proposal of ETV in shunt malfunction. In the most serious, certainly significant number of aborted procedures are reported because of a distorted or unsuitable anatomy, blurred vision, or some bleeding. So certainly this is not the procedure for uh, beginners. And it has also been proposed by Talamonti recently that the lower time interval between VP shunt and DTV seems to be a positive prognostic factor. In his series, if you check at his series, when you increase the um, interval between the VP shunt implant and the endoscopic ventriculostomy, there is a decrease of uh, um, success rate, so increasing number of failures. So, um, and the, the cutoff that were significant were uh, less or more than five years and less or more than 10 years. So certainly this is a thing or an aspect that should be uh, uh, kept in mind when treating with uh, uh, this patient. Our personal experience that has been reviewed by Piero Spennato uh, recently in the last 11 years, out of 40 patients, 37 hydrocephalus and three arachnoid cysts, uh, there were uh, 40 uh, patient 42 percent were overall shunt free zero aborted procedure about 23 failures with shunt reinsertion uh, lp shunt and uh, dva this is the overall series if we consider our series and uh, we divide the series in uh, two uh, situations. For example, 19, what we call the desperate patient, very, very complicated with CSF infection, abdominal problems, or multiple shunt procedure. In this case, this series has very, very low success rate. Sometimes we are even uh, adding choroid uh, plexus coagulation to this patient, but this patient, really, the success rate is very, very low, and we do it only because the situation is really uh, critical. But in a simpler patient, 21, a not complicated patient, the success rate in our last 10 years is 62% uh, with 13 successes. Certainly, these years, uh, the patient population was much more difficult if compared to the earliest years of our experience where there were a lot of aqueductal stenosis coming back with shunt malfunction. These patients were certainly more selected patient and more difficult patient, and this can explain for the lower success rate if compared to the uh, previous experience. Risk of complication is higher in secondary ATV than in primary ATV, uh, something uh, around the 31% versus 80%, 8% according to other published in 2008. In this case, for example, here is a shunt malfunctioning patient with a tectal plate tumor, and after ETV, you see that in a, we discovered on the post-operative MRI and completely asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic uh, intraparenchymal uh, hemorrhage. The results in shunt infection, uh, usual management of shunt infection, shunt removal, EVD and antibiotics, and shunt reinsertion, indication for ETV as alternative to shunt reinsertion, CSF must be clear. At the time of shunt removal, in case of distal infection, uh, ascites and abdominal pseudosis without ventriculitis, or in desperate cases as I said before and uh, our success rate is 40 55 percent in a, a little bit lower in the last years this is the literature but uh, maybe in very uh, selected uh, and very very difficult patient the success rate can be even lower than these numbers this is a case that went very went very nicely uh, with a um, very nice perforation of the uh, floor and uh, with a very nice uh, cistern below 
the floor of the third ventricle. This is a, and with a very good success. And this is another case, very complicated, a lot of shunt revision, a lot of infection, following posterior post surgery. And we were able to uh, identify the floor of the third ventricle, but when perforating the floor of the third ventricle, we found a lot of addition, a lot of cistern, uh, a lot of um, uh, membranes. And so in patients like this, certainly the situation is uh, much more uh, complicated. The, the patient was shunt free for one month. We cleared the um, uh, infection, but then we had to implant a deep shunt one month later. So in conclusion, the success rate of secondary ATV is encouraging more than 70% in overall population. It is reasonable to offer an option to become shunt free in patient with blocked shunt and suitable anatomy indicating obstructive hydrocephalus. Selection is important and the preoperative MRI is mandatory before uh, propose the endoscopic procedure to the patient. A history of a shunt infection is not a contraindication for ATV, but certainly the success rate is lower, 40-50%, and even lower when the patient is really very complicated with a multiple shunt revision, multiple episodes of a CSF infection. This is not a procedure for beginners due to the higher complication rate. Navigation, in our experience, is mandatory and is certainly mandatory in our department. Thank you very much. Giuseppe, thank you very much. Excellent, actually, brilliant, actually, because uh, all neurosurgeons in life meet with this problem. And ETV may be only one problem sometime in this dramatic situation. Only in my personal experience, I have, uh, for example, one case from Ukraine many, many years be before. Uh, small ba baby, maybe two years or one years, has uh, 15 or 20 revisions of the shunt surgery and only ETV uh, uh, saves the life. Or after ETV, no other surgeries. So this is very, uh, very important lecture today. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one I question. I have a question for Dr. I uh -huh. have one question for Dr. Okay. Chinali. Yeah. Sure. Okay, uh, okay. Dr. Tanali, I want to ask, where do you uh, put the neural navigation device? Do you put it on the instrument that you are putting in to do the stoma or on the endoscope itself? No, the, what is important is the ventricular entry. Uh, the most important and more difficult point of uh, this procedure is uh, finding the ventricle, because sometimes the ventricles are very small. Uh, then we, uh, when you... Uh, usually, with experience, we identify the place where to perform the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. When it is necessary, we insert the electromagnetic stylet inside ah, the okay. uh, inside yes. the working channel. Yes, we always use in uh, endoscopy electromagnetic navigation. This is very useful because with okay. the stylet, with the stylet, you can even create the first perforation of the floor. Okay. Okay, uh, our experience about this situation, uh, not, uh, uh, we have a very small endoscope uh, and we use this endoscope with the ultrasound navigation and also a very useful, very useful way, ultrasound real-time uh, navigation to, to punch the ventricle also. Yeah, yeah, I think that is re really very important to have some kind of guidance yeah. because uh, uh, with a small ventricle, uh, it can be very, very, very troublesome, and you can create damage to the patient. Giuseppe, also, what is your opinion about the, this kind of surgery for patients with uh, before two years hydrocephalus before two years? Your experience? Uh, it depends on the, not necessary. It it depends very much of the etiologies. Uh, we are we we look at the MRIs. We never so, so age, age for you, no limit, age? No. Only etiology? No, Only no, no. no. Uh, we just, uh, uh, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus prematures, we never do, never, yeah. never perform. Uh, but if we have a suitable, um, uh, isolated aqueductal stenosis, uh, even at one day of life, we try, uh, we try ETV. So results are lower, uh, success rate is lower if compared to uh, older children, but uh, we still try. Unless there are associated malformation, you know, if it is a uh, myelomeningocele, we don't do. If there are 
significant associated malformation like uh, a genesis of the corpus callosum or uh, you know uh, any other kind of cerebral malformation syndromic patients we uh, usually don't do that but isolated aqueductal stenosis we do that it's very rare very rare patients okay. Joachim your opinion Joachim yeah 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 your opinion your opinion about two years yeah. well, uh, I, actually, two years. I have actually a question I I mean the ETV in funded patients, uh, I think it's it's a good option. I think the our experience is is about the same. That we have the well, I would guess the same um, success rate as we have in the, in non-funded patients. The difference is that sometimes the anatomy is much more difficult. And exactly, if I agree with Pepe, when you see the all the membranes, you I, I basically you immediately know after the stoma that this is not going to work. You still try and try and you, you know, you fight, but at the end of the one or two months, you will end up with a shunt. Um, I have one question, Pepe, about the navigation. Uh, I have sometimes the impression that the accuracy of the navigation is quite accurate, but then you just move it a little bit and then it jumps to, to a different spot when you use the navigation, and which is very wrong. So I think the combination of intraoperative navigation at the floor, for example, and the real knowing the anatomy is very important. What do you think? Because I don't think about the, the burr hole. I mean, the burr hole and finding the ventricle, I see the problem. But, you know, many people use the navigation to find the exact spot for the stoma. And I think this is a little bit dangerous because, uh, you know, this, this has to be so accurate. You know, there's three, four millimeters might cause a disaster. Absolutely. I, I, I remember a very, very old polemic congress uh, with uh, Perneski uh, saying that uh, um, endoscopy had to be absolutely performed under a stereotactic guidance. Uh, and uh, of course, this is not true, absolutely. And uh, it is the same problem. Uh, I mean, the real advantage of endoscopy is that you see when you, uh, where you have to perform the whole. And fortunately, uh, the, the nature created a translucent floor in the vast majority of the cases. <laughs> But I must say that uh, maybe in uh, four or five percent of my patients, uh, especially almost all concentrated in the uh, shunt malfunction series, you really don't understand where to perform safely because there are so many adhesions and the floor is completely thick. And uh, your only point of uh, landmark is the uh, black spot, the red spot, or the infundibular recess. In those cases, really having a good navigation is uh, is very important. And the electromagnetic, that I don't, I don't, I don't feel the same uh, problem that you feel. I mean, it's uh, um, can be very reliable. I mean, we use the the the, the, the electromagnetic is very nice with the, with a small carpet below the head, and uh, it is very it's real real time navigation and. Uh, we uh, make a mixture between what we see and the navigation, of course. But in very few cases, it can really resolve your case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Joseph, uh, have you experience with uh, use ETV in slit ventricle syndrome? What is yes. your opinion? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, we never do ETV uh, because of slit ventricle syndrome. Fortunately, in, uh, in our series, uh, real slit ventricle syndrome is very rare. Uh, I must admit that in the last 20 years, I have probably resolved uh, maybe two slit ventricle syndrome with the ETV, but uh, no more than this. Uh, otherwise, the, 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 the real solution, unfortunately, still remains, in my experience, the, the head enlargement, the cranioplasty. I have uh, near the 10 cases about uh, slit ventricle syndrome and I, I, I do ETV with very good results. It is only one way to, to, to receive the receive, uh, safe of the life, yeah. my opinion. I, I, I agree. I mean, if, if, your, option. if your patient has an aqueductal stenosis and he has a uh, slit ventricle syndrome and you know that uh, his first etiology was aqueductal stenosis, then of course ETV is a, uh, is a very good option. But of course you have a recruitment that is from such a huge area 
with uh, such a vast um, uh, variety of uh, neurosurgeon having treated patients before that you can face every kind of patient, really a great variety. Our setting is a little bit smaller, of course. We don't have your uh, population of patients and we take care of uh, our patient as a unique center. So um, uh, we know very well our population and all the candidates to ETV are uh, submitted to uh, endoscopic surgery immediately. So we don't have so many shunt malfunction in aqueductal stenosis. So it's a, I think this is a very important thing. Okay. And Giuseppe, a sec, uh, question. What is about uh, another place, not only ETV, it's possible for shunt malfunction endoscopy, for example, lamina terminalis, or, uh, uh, had... opening of the majandia, something like that. What is no, your opinion? I... I know, I know that uh, with the flexible scope, so Ben Wolf has uh, a lot of uh, experience with that. Uh, I have only done it twice uh, with a 50% success. <laughs> so I'm not very, I'm not very, uh, I have no data about that. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Good lecture. Thank amazing, you. amazing. Thank, Thank you very much. So next, our... Uh, our faculty is uh, Anila Darbar from Pakistan. Anila, please. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I really want to thank you, the Endoscopy Committee for the World Federation and Dr. Dio Pajari and Dr. Mahmoud Qureshi to invite me for this lecture. And uh, I'm going to just start sharing my screen. Uh, so the topic I was given today was the complication avoidance in uh, surgery for intraventricular tumor. Uh, I am Dr. Neela Darbar and I am from uh, Pakistan. I work in two different places, two different hospitals. One of them is this and one of them is this hospital. It's funny that they actually look alike when they are about 850 kilometers apart. Uh, so uh, with that, I am going to start my presentation. So uh, the first part is that uh, what kind of pathologies are there in the intraventricular area that you have to be cognizant of? And of course, this part is more for the juniors and the residents uh, who are actually watching this lecture. And the most common thing we see is the colloid cyst, but we also see some germ cells, low grades, spinocytoma, central neurocytoma, craniopharyngioma is something that's common. Metastatic is quite rare, and Dr. Ortel showed a case where there was a little tiny metastasis where a colloid should have been. Uh, anaplastic, choroid plexus papilloma, malignant gliomas. I uh, am going to present actually two cases of GBM that I have actually uh, seen in my career uh, as uh, interventricular solid tumors, sarcoma and xanthomas. So uh, there are several ways of approaching it. You have an anterior transcortical, posterior transcortical, anterior transcolosal, posterior transcolosal. You can do subtemporal, occipital transtentorial, or intratentorial uh, supracellar. But uh, these are the uh, four approaches that, um, uh, th that I usually do and I'm going to more concentrate on. And uh, with that, um, the, the, the first thing that I want to teach uh, to the junior ones are the what is the difference between a transcortical versus a transcolosal approach, because these are the two most common approaches uh, a surgeon uses for uh, any removal of any kind of interventricular lesion. And for transcortical, you have a better lateral to medial trajectory, you have a wider access to the lateral ventricle, there is no risk to the CP sagittal sinus and bridging veins. For transcolosal, you are medial and you have an access to both foramen of Monroe, which you can't get through a transcortical. Uh, you need a smaller neural incision. There are multiple corridors to third ventricle. As I said, that you can go anterior colossal, posterior colossal, you can go occipital transtentorial. And it's usually possible in case of a small tumor, but actually a large, very large tumor can also be accessed uh, through transcolosal region. However, there are also cons to either one of them. And for transcortical, you need a pre-existing hydrocephalus. Uh, it is difficult to manage uh, the contralateral because you only see one foramen of Monroe. You need a wider frontal corticotomy. For transcolosal, it's usually a very deep and a narrow surgical corridor. But they are, you have the potential of damaging the bridging veins from the sagittal sinus. 
and difficult interhemispheric dissection in case you have intracranial hypertension. So the first one that I'm gonna uh, talk about is endoscopic transcortical transventricular transforamina. And the most common lesion that we do is usually a colloid cyst. And again, the idea that whether a tumor should be less than two centimeter, you can do it endoscopically, but if it's greater than four centimeter, I think the best thing is to do an endoscopic assistant and not a pure endoscopic. Um, the best uh, uh, colloid cyst that can be done pure endoscopically is the one with the soft contents and the enlarged ventricles. And the approach is usually anterolateral from right to uh, right, uh, uh, right to left, and initial decompression is needed. So this is a colloid cyst, but this I feel is just too large uh, as compared to this one, which was small and can be easily removed through pure endoscopy procedures. So this one, if uh, uh, I, I would, if I were have to do this, I would not do it pure endoscopically. I would actually do a transcortical inter, uh, trans. Uh, ventricular approach, but um, we'll do an endoscopic assisted, which means a combination of both microscope and endoscope. Um, just a quick, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, what happened to my video here? I just apologize for one second. Uh, I'm so sorry, somehow my video is not playing here. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm, I apologize somehow. I don't know what happened to my video here. Yeah. Okay, apologize for that. I think I'm going to go ahead because uh, otherwise just to save the time. So sometimes something that you think is a colloid cyst may actually not be a colloid cyst. And uh, Uh, and this is an example for that. And uh, this is an example of actually a third ventricular lipoma, uh, a seven year old boy with six month history of headache and two episodes of temporary loss of consciousness exam was not focal. And I hope my video works here. Ah, uh, I don't know what's happening. I apologize. Oops, I have an issue with my video here. Metin is suggesting that your videos and PowerPoint should be in the same folder and then they would, is, are they in the same folder? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's in the same folder. Uh, you can actually, I can put another folder in here. Uh, you did, this is a copied one, so it should not have an issue. But I can start the, the folder here as well. And let's see if it works. Uh, maybe I'll come back to the video. Uh, let me see, let's see if this works. No, it's not working. Uh, let me try it once more. No, it's not working. I apologize. Uh, I don't know why it's not working. And it's in the same folder actually, and it was working before and somehow it's not right now. So basically this was a video of uh, showing a third ventricular lipoma and uh, uh, and this was a video of a supracellar cyst. Uh, what I wanted to show that the three different lesions that you can have in that area that you can access through an endoscopic transventricular approach is a colloid cyst, an arachnoid cyst, a craniopharyngioma uh, that you can access through here. And, uh, and the complication avoidance that in this area that you really have to understand is the content of the colloid cyst when it actually comes out, it can cause aseptic meningitis. Similarly, if you are puncturing a, a craniopharyngioma with the, the oily content, when it comes out, it can cause aseptic meningitis. And one should be cognizant that if it happens, you can start steroids with that. Sometimes unilateral hydrocephalus can happen if you're going transportical. Injury to the fornix, if you're going from the right side, should not be a problem. It's a smaller injury. Usually, I feel that left fornix is more important than the right fornix. And of course, uh, 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 this is an open debate. I can ask the experience from uh, the giants here that what do they think that injury to the fornix is, uh, does it cause any kind of a significant uh, memory issue or not? Injury to the thalamostriate vein leading to interventricular hemorrhage is a major concern because 
Uh, and usually I feel that if you are actually monopolar, monopolaring the choroid plexus in that area, uh, you should have a heat which it should be set up in a very low uh, temperature uh, and should be very cognizant, not going around the thalamus right vein. Uh, and uh, if intraventricular hemorrhage happens, then of course EVD is uh, something that uh, you have to immediately do and abandon the procedure. Fever, in my experience, uh, for these kind of cases, and I feel, is it just uh, because if the, if you use a warm uh, ringer lactate, sometimes I feel that the hypothalamic temperature is actually resetted, and these patients have fever, but they don't have any uh, signs of raised infection signs, uh, but they do have a fever, which uh, I had three or four patients that had that, and the fever actually subsided in three to four days, uh, without needing any antibiotic and all of them had the cultures and everything sent and nothing actually came back to be positive. Another is a hypothalamic injury, especially if you are puncturing a second hole, if you have a supracellar arachnoid cyst uh, and you are trying to puncture, uh, the first layer would be the one that goes through the foramen and the second layer that actually goes through uh, may damage the hypothalamic injury. And so one needs to be very cognizant about what kind of hypothalamic injury can you get. Vascular injury, again, I have seen it uh, that uh, the, the craniopharyngiomas, the, the ones that are supracellar and more cystic, as well as arachnoid cyst, when you actually puncture the floor or the other layer of it, there are a lot of vessels around that area. And uh, if, if one has to be very, very careful uh, these vascular injuries can be devastating if it's a brain, uh, if it's a brainstem, a small feeder can actually lead to a, a brainstem infarction. So one has to be really, really careful. One experience I had was a memory body injury uh, uh, to a 17 year old uh, child who uh, immediately actually developed uh, enterograde amnesia, uh, which uh, about uh, took about three months to resolve. Uh, so that was one patient that I had. And hemiparesis is something that we are usually not cognizant about when we are doing uh, the endoscopic transcortical transventricular surgery. But it is very important to understand that the genome of the internal capsule is actually very near the foramen or near the foramen of uh, Monroe on the lateral side. And uh, any inadvertent injury, for example, if you are moving the endoscope in or out, and any inadvertent injury to the genome of internal capsule can actually lead to hemiparesis. The second surgical approach that I want to talk about is the anterior transcalosal and the posterior transcalosal approaches. And there are usually three routes that you can enter. One is the transforaminal, you can have transforniceal, or you can enter it through the transcoroidal route. And through transforaminal, you get access to the anterior third ventricle. The foramen of Monroe is identified. If dilated, then access is easier. If not, then incision is can be made through one column of the fornix at the anterior superior edge to just little dilate the uh, foramen. For the transcoroidal, you need uh, entry in the middle of the third ventricle, then this is a better approach and is opening through the velum positive and between the two internal cerebral vein through the tenia fornices uh, of uh, the fornix or through the tenia choroidea of the thalamus. You can either use one of those approaches uh, to enter in between the internal cerebral veins uh, through the velum positive into the middle of the third ventricle if that's where your tumor is located. You can also use a transforniceal approach in which an incision is given in the body of the fornix, not exceeding about 1.5 to 2 centimeters behind the foramen of the So I'm going to present some of the cases of uh, intraventricular tumor that I'd encountered in my career. So a 12-year-old boy who presented to our hospital with about one to two month history of inability to walk, had gait imbalance, minimal right leg weakness, blurry vision, and papilledema. And this was uh, the tumor uh, because of the age, we, uh, we thought that uh, initially a biopsy should be taken to make sure that it is uh, not germinoma. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, we do not have uh, uh, the CSF markers uh, for germinoma and we can only do some serum markers. Uh, so because of the absence of uh, CSF markers, we decided to do uh, a biopsy. And uh, 
the, uh, I usually do it through a rigid endoscope or zero degree endoscope. We do not have the luxury of a flexible endoscope here. Uh, and post ETV, his gait and visual symptoms improve and patho pathology come back to be a pilocytic astrocytoma, which was BRAF, uh, V600E positive and fusion negative. The next we decided uh, to do an interhemispheric transcalosal transcornithial approach, a neuronavigation guided, which just like Dr. Chinali said, for me is also absolutely mandatory. I would not do it without the navigation. Uh, and this was the initial uh, uh, image. And uh, I wish my, I hope my video works here. Uh, no, it's some problem with my videos. All my videos are corrupted. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, at least this one works. So this was the tumor uh, and it looked like more grayish solid. And again, it was a pilocytic astrocytoma. This was the post-operative scan. And there was a little bit of tumor which was left behind the thalamus, but most of them, uh, the tumor was resected. Uh, and uh, this uh, child was then given uh, chemotherapy for the little bit of residual that was left behind. Case number two is a 14 year old girl who presented with blurry vision and headache for about seven to eight months. She had VP Shan placed in an outside facility and was then referred for the definitive treatment. Neurologically, she had no deficits. And this was the preoperative MRI. So you can see this tumor is actually starting from the anterior third and going all the way down to the posterior third um, of the uh, third ventricle. Initially, she also underwent an endoscopic transpyramidal biopsy. It again came back to be a pilocytic astrocytoma. Uh, and then as a second stage, she underwent an interhemispheric transcalosal resection of the tumor. This was the post-op scan. There was some tumor that was left underneath at the hypothalamic area that I left because I was a bit scared of not removing it uh, for injury to the hypothalamic area. And she also received uh, chemotherapy uh, for, the, for the residual pilocytic astrocytoma. The third case I want to present is a lady, 29 year old with history of hyponatremia and seizures and preoperative MRI showed into a third ventricular uh, hypogenous lesion. Uh, when she came in, she had actually dropped her GCS and developed hydrocephalus, which required a VP shunt, which initially we did. Uh, this, was her, this was the preoperative MRI. And again, we used the same transcalosal approach, anterior transcalosal approach to do this procedure. And unluckily, uh, uh, this came out to be a glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, the patient was started on adjuvant radio and chemotherapy, and within three months, she was actually lost to my follow-up, uh, and, and I tried to get some information, and then I found that she had actually passed away. The fourth case is a 53-year-old with complaints of seizure and lower limb weakness. Uh, right lower extremity power was four, and MRI showed uh, multifocal enhancing nodules within the choroid and ventricular lining as well as the body of the corpus callosum. And as you can see, this is a very ugly looking tumor, which is actually in the lateral ventricles and going into the third ventricle, going into the atrium of the lateral ventricles. Uh, and considering the age, um, the, the question was that this could be a, a malignant lesion. So the first thing we decided to do a, a biopsy only and uh, he developed post-operative uh, hydrocephalus requiring VP shunt and this patient's pathology also came back to be GBM. So I was quite surprised because I had never seen GBM uh, before these two cases uh, in uh, the third ventricle. Um, so this for me it was a bit surprising but these two actually came back to back for me um, and I then uh, gave me an idea that GBM can also happen in that area. 
The fifth case is of a 30-year-old with history of headaches, vertigo, and seizures for three months. On exam, had left hemiparesis and MRI show midline extensive heterogeneous mass involving an extensive area and abutting the cortex. And as you can see, that this was also quite an extensive lesion involving the corpus callosum, uh, involving the lateral ventricle, involving the third, complete third ventricle from anterior to posterior. Uh, we only did a partial resection of this uh, lesion because during uh, the, sorry, during the uh, frozen section, we actually found that this was also a GVM, um, uh, uh, like a higher grade, not sorry, GVM, but like a higher grade glioma. Uh, so I, I wanted to insist that uh, for these kind of lesions that are quite large and fill the third ventricle, pure endoscopic procedures are actually quite not possible. One should strive for doing uh, endoscopic assisted neurosurgery in which uh, what I do is first I use a neuro navigation uh, to define my trajectory and define where I want to make an incision. Then I do a craniotomy and actually the major part of the tumor resection I usually do with a microscope. And then assessing the degree of tumor resection, I would enter an endoscope uh, to see if there's any residual or hidden tumor that are left behind. It does not add any morbidity to the procedure and uh, you can actually remove some hidden parts of the tumor that are not uh, seen by the microscope. And this is just uh, that microscope gives you that kind of view and you can actually, the, the, some of the tumors can be hidden, but when you use an endoscope, then uh, because the endoscope has a movement, you can actually see the hidden tumors that could be seen on the, uh, the side of corridors. So this is an example that uh, the, uh, one of the, the lesions that the posterior third ventricle I was doing, there was a little hidden tumor, which I couldn't see from the microscope initially, but then I was able to see through the endoscope. Uh, and then uh, this is after the removal uh, of that little hidden area uh, after the endoscopic view. And this is another case of almost similar uh, pathology. I'm not going to go through this. And this is sort of the incision. And uh, I do not think my video is going to work, but I can try. No, nope. OK. Uh, so in conclusion, I uh, want to say that, in, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I uh, this conclusion is in the wrong place. Sorry about that. So the last one that I want to go through is through the occipital transtentorial uh, lesion. And it was first described by uh, Dandy and then Poppin and then by Jameson. And it's an actually a modified interhemispheric suboccipital approach. Usually it's a, a unilateral approach uh, through the occiput and uh, it's usually behind, uh, below the lambdoid. Uh, and it actually gives quite an excellent view of a very, of very large tumors. If you are uncomfortable doing a supracellar uh, 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 supracerebellar intertentorial approach. Uh, the, the only problem is that the corridor is very narrow, but you can get an excellent CSF drainage. It's a very comfortable operative position. You have to put patient in uh, 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 two thirds prone position. You can do it standing. Uh, the only thing that you, be, you have to be, be aware of, as you know, neurosurgery is all about plan B, that you need to uh, understand your complications and avoid it beforehand is the occipital lobe retraction. So um, uh, I have seen one case in which the occipital lobe retraction actually led to blindness in that patient. So uh, what uh, I would suggest that uh, if, even if you're using a retraction, please use the retraction sparingly, like you uh, uh, take the retraction off or maybe just use a hand retraction that can be constantly positioned so there's not a uh, uh, pressure on the occipital lobe continuously. One other thing that you have to be uh, careful about this area, uh, this area and this uh, surgical technique is the post-operative subdural hematoma, uh, which can also happen. And the last is that you have to be cognizant of the straight sinus. So when you are doing this procedure, uh, you have to uh, go transtentorial and you have to make, cut, cut the transtentorially just underneath the, uh, the straight sinus. 
and, and that is something that you have to be because a straight sinus bleed can actually lead to quite a devastating hemorrhage. Similarly, when you are going to enter into the posterior third ventricular area, you are going to encounter uh, the vein of Galen, the angel cerebral veins, and you have to be really cognizant of those as well. And I don't think so this is going to work. Nope. So some of the complications uh, that uh, you can encounter generally in all the interventricular surgeries, the disconjugate extraocular muscles usually I have seen in uh, cases when you are actually doing an occipital transtentorial because of the quadrage, the proximity of the quadrigeminal plate. But uh, in my experience, uh, this con disconjugate gaze actually resolves and so usually temporarily. In very few cases, it becomes permanent. Uh, if you are near the uh, midbrain area, then somnolence can happen initially, but it can also uh, be a temporary deficit. Hemiparesis, hemiplegia, and abulism can also be uh, there, but usually a, new, a temporary neurologic deficit sometimes can become a permanent deficit, so have to be very, very cognizant if you are doing this procedure. Um, these are, again, some of the... Uh, this is a this is an example I want to give that he had disconjugate gaze, which actually later on improved. The other complications that one has to be aware of is just general complications uh, of DVT, aseptic meningitis, the subdural hematoma, uh, the status epilepticus, if you are especially in the interventricular area doing any kind of tumor resection, uh, sometimes patient uh, leads to undiagnosed hydrocephalus post-surgery. So as uh, Dr. Chanali said that EVD is absolutely mandatory. So please do put in EVD when you're doing this kind of procedure, even if it's for just one day or two day, but it really helps you to measure the ICP. It really helps you uh, to understand that uh, if any kind of uh, uh, undiagnosed hydrocephalus can be immediately recognized and treated. Pneumonia and PE are also complications that can happen with these kind of lesions, especially if it's, uh, uh, especially if you have, um, I'm so sorry about this, especially if you have uh, uh, GBM or uh, uh, a malignant glioma. So in conclusion, uh, surgery of the interventricular lesion is challenging. The approach, again, needs to be tailored due to the lesion. You can, the four workhorses, I believe, is a transportical approach, which can be endoscopic, which can be microscopic. The two transcalosal approaches, which is the anterior transcalosal and posterior transcalosal. Uh, the anterior transcalosal can be through the foramen, which can be widened. The posterior transcalosal, you can do a transformesial approach or to reach the posterior area of the third ventricle. Endoscopy is essential in the contemporary management of the ventricular tumor. Surgery for the third, tu uh, third ventricular tumor is a high risk because if you are in the anterior area, then there's hypothalamus there, which can potentially get injured. The mammillary bodies can get injured. They are vascular uh, uh, the, the vessels, especially as I said, in craniopharyngiomas that can injured and can, can cause complication in posterior area the quadrigeminal plate, the internal cerebral veins. So there are a lot of uh, uh, very, very important structures in the, in the anterior and the posterior part of the third ventricle, which a junior neurosurgeon has to be very, very cognizant when they are doing these kind of procedures. And as I said, that the permanent uh, kind of uh, uh, disability can happen with the degrees of hypothalamus or the midbrain involvement damage. Thank you, and I am again apologizing that my video wasn't working, and I was so excited to show my videos, but I guess I'm unlucky today. Anya, Anya, thank you very much. Excellent presentation, excellent. Thank you very much. And also a very important topic for all neurosurgeons uh, in the world, because uh, endosc endoscopy, endoscopy is uh, a very development, rapidly development field of surgery, but very risky also. So why avoidance of the complications is a very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from faculty? Giuseppe, you want to ask? I see. Anila, yeah. <laughs> Anila. 
you 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 have some you have some experience with the um, interfornicial uh, approach. So sorry, with the transcoroidal approach. Sometimes when you no. when, when you have some posterior interventricular tumor, I uh, cut the anterior septal vein and open the transcoroidal approach. This is not an approach that I used to do very frequently, but I'm doing that more and more frequently, and I think it's a it's a it's a fantastic approach. What is your experience, and do you have some special uh, clue about this approach if you have uh, if you have done it? Dr. Chinali, I have actually not done a single transcoroidal approach. The ones that I usually do is uh, the the other two that I spoke about. Uh, so no, I haven't done any. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, during, uh, I mean, uh, uh, when when doing a standard transcalosal approach, I uh, frequently found uh, uh, a lot of difficulties in patients with chronic hydrocephalus, where there can be the two cingulate gyri can be extremely adherent uh, to each other. And I was one thing I do only pediatric neurosurgery. I was wondering if this is the same. Uh, problem also in adult neurosurgery because sometimes the two cingulate gyri are so adherent to each other that the, the, the dissection and the separation of the two cingulate gyri is the most difficult part of the procedure. <laughs> you have any experience of that? No, I, in adults I have never experienced the, the cingular gyrus problem, but there are sometimes what I have experienced is uh, uh, the, the collapse of the ventricles. So okay. uh, I had a couple of cases of a simple colloid cyst actually, uh, but because of the uh, collapse of the ventricle, I had to convert the procedure from a pure endoscopic uh, into an open approach. Uh, okay. And I tried to flush the ventricle with uh, ring lactate to fill it up, but somehow I was unable to. Is there a, any tips or tricks in case something like that happens? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Joachim, no? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Anima. Thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we finish our session about interventricular regions. Uh, thank you very much for all participants, for all lectures, uh, for all faculties. Uh, Professor Diapujari. Professor Dukujar is driving his car. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Albert. Thank you yeah, so much. You. Really. Okay. Very, very nice. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Anila. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. You have the program for next week. Uh, and sorry program. about the video.